So welcome to our first video lecture for 227. Um, we're going to be talking about the topic of homeostasis. And so I think when with the very first video we just hop into this, students are always kind of like, I signed up for an anatomy and physiology class and I'm here to learn about muscles and bones and the brain, right, and those kinds of things. And so why are we starting out with homeostasis? Here's why. This is a topic that is absolutely central to anatomy and physiology. So once you understand homeostasis, it's going to carry you through 227. It's going to carry you through 228, right? Our second anatomy and physiology class. And it's also going to be really helpful for any biology class that you take from here on out. So having an understanding of homeostasis is kind of a core theme of anatomy and physiology because it's driving everything that happens in the body. So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to give you kind of a formal definition of what homeostasis is. And then we'll spend the rest of this video trying to get you past this formal definition to really understanding it. So we'll use some analogies. Um, I'll give you some actual examples in the body. I'll give you some of my tips and tricks and pitfalls for things that I see students screwing up over and over again with this particular topic so that you're really familiar with homeostasis and you're good to go for the rest of the class. So here's our formal definition for what homeostasis is. It's the body's maintenance of a stable internal environment despite varying external conditions. So you know, right, you've experienced this. You can go outside when it's 98 degrees outside and you may feel a little bit hot, right? But you don't get overheated, um, generally speaking. You can go outside when it's 40 degrees outside, right? And you may feel a little bit cool, but your body is going to maintain that internal temperature of 98.6 degrees. Your oxygen levels are going to be the same. Your carbon dioxide levels, pH is going to stay the same in the body. So your body is very, very good at regulating its internal environment and keeping it consistent, okay, despite what's going on around you and what's going on outside of your body. And the reason that it does this is because all of the chemical reactions that are happening, thousands of them that are going on in your body all the time, they need to be taking place at a very specific temperature and at a very specific pH and with very specific oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels and those kinds of things. So our bodies actually use most of our energy. Most of the energy from the food that you eat is going just to maintain this homeostasis and keep things internally the same despite what's going on outside of your body. Now you know, okay, right, you can override this, you can push past your body's limits, you could go out into the Sahara Desert when it's 120 degrees without water, right, and without shade and without those kinds of things, and you would eventually get overheated, and if that wasn't treated, you would die. And by the same token, you could go out onto the tundra, right, in the winter um, without a coat, without the proper gear, and you would eventually become hypothermic, and if that wasn't treated, you would die, right? So we can override this, but our bodies are very, very good at fighting very, very hard to keep that internal environment the same because it's so important to the functioning of the body. So that's kind of our formal definition of what homeostasis is. And what I want to do now is um, talk about some examples. So give you some analogies, talk about some specific examples in the body, get more into how it actually works so that you can start to develop a really good understanding of this particular topic. So here's an analogy that kind of helps to explain how homeostasis actually works. And I'm using a topic that I think is a little bit more familiar to most people, um, and that's heating of a house, right, and cooling of a house. So most people are familiar with the thermostat in their home and how that actually works. And you know that whether it's negative 20 outside in the winter or 110 degrees in the summer, that if you want to, you can keep your house 70 degrees, right? You can keep that internal environment of your home consistent year round. And we do that through um, a thermostat. So a thermostat is helping to maintain homeostasis. It's helping to maintain an internal consistent temperature um, in your home despite what's going on outside. So if you look at this diagram here, this has got kind of an example of how a thermostat actually works, right? You're gonna set it and let's say 
You want to keep your house at 70 degrees year round. That's where you're most comfortable. Um, and let's say that it's summer. It's 100 degrees outside. The sun is beating down on your roof and it's heating your attic space and that's heating up your home as well. Sun is streaming through the windows, adding that heat energy into your home. And you want it to be at 70 degrees, okay? But the sun is doing things that are making that temperature start to creep up. So it's going past 70 degrees to 71 degrees. In your home, you have a thermometer that's located in the thermostat. And that thermometer is going to pick up this change in temperature. And it's gonna communicate, hey, the internal temperature of the house is increasing with the thermostat and specifically the control center in the thermostat. So once it's determined that your house, that, they, that it's increasing in heat, what's gonna happen next is we're gonna have a response to that, right? So if it's summertime, um, what's gonna happen in that case is your air conditioner is gonna kick in, right? And that air conditioner turning on is gonna start to put cool air into your home and it's gonna bring that temperature back down to the 70 degrees where you wanted it to be. So despite what's going on with the sun and the windows and the attic space and everything heating up, you are keeping that internal environment in your home consistent. That's homeostasis and we've got, believe it or not, the exact same thing that happens in the body. If we go to this picture over here, so this is showing what happens maybe um, on a cold wintry day, right? You want your house to be 70 degrees, but it's snowing outside, the wind is blowing, it's cold, it's dark, it's all of those things that winter is in Idaho. And so we set it to 70 degrees, but it's starting to creep down and your room's starting to become cooler than that. So again, we have that thermometer in the thermostat that's gonna pick that up, it knows. Temperature in the house is decreasing. That's gonna be communicated, okay, through the control center of the thermostat, which will turn the heater on. And of course, once the heater's on, it starts blowing warm air into all of your rooms, and that's gonna bring that temperature right back up. Okay, so a great example of homeostasis, a great analogy because believe it or not, the way that body temperature, which is one of those things that's maintained by homeostasis, the way that body temperature is maintained and controlled works exactly like this. It works on the exact same system. There's one other thing that I wanna say about this before we go to the next slide. So we've talked about a thermostat and we've talked about when it's becoming cold, we do something to make it warmer, right? When it's becoming hot, we do something to keep it cooler. And the goal is that we don't wanna be here or here, we wanna be in that middle range, right? In that homeostatic range. And the way that we keep things in a homeostatic range is through what's known as negative feedback. So that is a term that's hugely important that you're gonna be hearing throughout this class. And so I wanna make sure that you really understand what negative feedback is. But I wanna introduce it to you here because the way that a thermostat works in your home to control the temperature in your home and keep it consistent is through negative feedback. And we see negative feedback um, playing a role in the body as well and doing the exact same thing. So we looked at how a thermostat works in the house, right? And talked about the fact that it is regulating things through what's known as negative feedback. And that we've got the exact same system that's present and working in the body. And I wanna show you this, because this is really the case. Um, your body, as far as the way that it regulates body temperature, works just like the thermostat in your house. So here are some diagrams that are pretty similar to what we saw um, with the last slide, except for this is showing what's going on with body temperature and regulating it. So normal body temperature, of course, is 98.6 degrees. Um, and normal would be considered about a degree higher, about a degree lower than that. That's our homeostatic range with 98.6 being the average. But if we get much higher than that, it can start to cause problems. Um, because remember, all of those chemical reactions that are happening in the body have to happen at a certain temperature. And when we start getting temperatures that are too high or temperatures that are too low, um, it starts to interfere with those chemical reactions. It starts to denature proteins that are located throughout the body, which means that chemical reactions can't happen. Um, and it's not a good thing. So our body works really hard to keep our body temperature within that homeostatic range. So let's say you've got average body temperature, it's 98.6, but it's a really hot day outside. It's 100 degrees and you're playing in a baseball game right um, your body temperature just being outside in the heat in the sun 
it's going to start to creep up. And believe it or not, just like what we have in our homes, there are receptors in the body. They're called thermoreceptors, and they are kind of built-in thermometers that we have in our bodies. And they're going to recognize, hey, body temperature is starting to increase above that 98.6 degrees. In your brain, there's a structure which is known as the hypothalamus. So it's very centrally located in the brain. And this is the body's thermostat. So the thermoreceptors, the thermometers, okay, are gonna communicate this information with the hypothalamus, which is acting as the control center or the thermostat, if you will. And what the hypothalamus is gonna do with that information is determine, okay, we need to decrease body temperature and here's how we're gonna do it, right? So the hypothalamus is gonna tell blood vessels in the skin to constrict and, I'm sorry, to dilate. And the reason for that is it's going to shunt blood to the surface of the body. And you may have noticed, right, when you're outside on a hot day, um, you start to get red, you start to get flushed, and that's because your body is sending blood to its surface. Blood is at a higher temperature than body temperature always. And so by shunting blood to the surface of the body, what the body can do is radiate some excess heat and start to get rid of heat that way. But the other thing that we're all familiar with that helps to cool down the body that's controlled by this hypothalamus um, is sweat glands. So when body temperature starts to creep up above 98.6 degrees, the hypothalamus is gonna turn those sweat glands on, if you will. You're gonna to start to sweat, and as that water evaporates off your skin, it's gonna carry heat away with it. And in normal circumstances, right, you could override this by sitting in the Sahara Desert all day, but in normal circumstances, this is enough to bring that body temperature back down and kind of keep it within that homeostatic range of 98.6 degrees, plus or minus a degree. If we go to this diagram over here, so showing the exact same thing, right, but how it works in the opposite direction. So let's imagine it's a cold winter day, you've got the normal body temperature, 98.6 degrees, but you go outside to play fetch with your dog or whatever and you're like, I'm not going to be out there that long so I won't put on a coat. Um, as you're out there, your body temperature is going to start to drop, okay? And as it starts to move out of that range where it needs to be kept, that decrease in temperature is gonna be detected by those thermoreceptors, those thermometers that are located in the body and communicated with the hypothalamus. And then the hypothalamus is gonna do a couple of things. The first thing that it's gonna do is it is going to shut off the sweat glands, right? Because if you're already starting to be too cold, the last thing we want happening is you sweating, which is gonna make you colder. So we'll shut down the sweat glands. The other kind of first line of response for the hypothalamus is it's going to constrict the blood vessels to the skin because again, blood's at a higher temperature than body temperature. If we can keep that blood like deeper down in the core of the body, it's gonna keep the organs and the really important structures in our bodies um, warmer and at the temperature where they need to be. If those two things aren't enough, then the next thing that you'll see happening is the hypothalamus will continue to try to heat the body back up. And it will do this um, by actually activating skeletal muscles, right? And when they become active, they start to do these contractions, right? And that's what shivering is. And the reason that that happens is because every time a muscle in your body contracts, it generates heat. And so you're literally generating heat to try and keep your body temperature um, up in that range where it needs to be through those muscle contractions that are occurring. So we've been talking about negative feedback, right? And I said negative feedback is what helps our bodies to maintain homeostasis. And I also said that I was gonna give you kind of some tips and tricks and things that I very commonly see students messing up with this particular topic. So here is the first thing that I over and over again see students messing up and I don't want you to make this mistake, okay? they see this term negative and they assume that means okay oh negative feedback it has negative in the term right so it has to be bad it's something we don't want happening in the body that is not okay what this means um that is not what this means at all okay and the other mistake that i see students making when they see this term negative 
is they think it means, okay, negative feedback always decreases something, right? So like negative feedback decreases your body temperature or negative feedback decreases your oxygen levels or whatever, right? So it has to do with decreasing, okay? That's a mistake I see students making over and over again. It has nothing to do with decreasing, okay? Negative feedback can increase your body temperature. Negative feedback will increase your oxygen levels if need be. Negative feedback will cause things to increase when it's needed. What this term actually means and where it's actually coming from, um, negative, is that negative feedback negates change okay so forget all of this stuff get that out of your brain because none of it's true because it negates change it allows us to be able to maintain homeostasis because it allows us to be able to maintain homeostasis it's like a good thing right we want to be able to do that or else you would die so it's not bad and it's not always decreasing um, if your body temperature is becoming too high on a hot day negative feedback is going to negate that change and it's going to bring it back down okay so not always um, increasing not always decreasing if your body temperature is too low it's a cold day negative feedback is going to negate that and bring it back up so don't fall into this pattern of seeing that word negative and kind of um, applying that to maybe how that word is used or how that word is thought of in everyday language because that's not the case. It's negative feedback because it negates change. If something's increasing beyond where we want it to be, it negates that change and brings it back down. If something's decreasing beyond where we want it to be, it negates that change and brings it back up. That's what negative feedback is and that's why it helps you to be able to maintain homeostasis. So we've been talking about negative feedback and the fact that it helps the body maintain homeostasis, that it negates change, that it's the most common type of feedback that you see in the body. However, it's not the only type of feedback that you see in the body. And so I also want to talk just a little bit about what's known as positive feedback. So I'm probably not gonna put as much focus on this positive feedback as I did um, with the negative feedback because there's really only a couple of situations that I can think of where it's actually occurring in the body um, and we will get to those we'll talk about those but before we do I want to get into some common misconceptions that I see students having about positive feedback so here's the first one right they see that word positive and they think, oh, positive, yay, that's good, everybody's happy, things are going well. So positive feedback in the body means good, okay? That is not what it means, okay? Another um, misconception that I see is it's positive feedback, right? So positive, if something's positive, it's increasing, right? And so they get this misconception that positive feedback increases body temperature, right? Positive feedback um, increases oxygen levels or increases pH or things like that. That is not at all the case. Here's what the positive in positive feedback actually means, okay? It is closer to the word amplify. And so when we're talking about positive feedback, we are talking about a system that's going to amplify a change in the body, okay? And this is exactly why you don't see it very commonly, because if we're amplifying change and you develop a fever, what positive feedback would do is it would make your body temperature hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, right? And cycle it out of control. Um, if we are talking about body temperature and you're hypothermic, okay? positive feedback is gonna amplify that change, which means it's gonna decrease the temperature more and more and more, right? Until you become so hypothermic that you die. So it's not a situation where we're saying, yay, it's good, it's positive, it's happy. Um, we're not saying it's always increasing something because it can further decrease something, right? What it's doing is it's amplifying a change that is already occurring in the body and that's why we don't see it very frequently in the body because positive feedback is gonna drive you away from homeostasis, okay? It's gonna move you further from the set point rather than trying to bring you back to it. There are a couple of situations in the body where we need that to happen, okay? Um, one is blood clotting, actually. And the second big one is labor and childbirth. So we actually see positive feedback happening in labor and childbirth 
for a short period of time. If it didn't happen, you would never be able to give birth, at least not naturally. Um, and so there are places where it's needed, where we need change to be amplified in order for something to be able to happen in the body. But as soon as that positive feedback has met its goal, it's amplified to the point that whatever it was that needed to happen, whether it's a baby being born or blood clotting has happened, we're now gonna go right back to negative feedback to get the body back towards homeostasis. So this is going to be probably the worst drawing that any professor has ever drawn for you. But here is my representation of the uterus. So that's a hollow muscular sac, right, that females have um, in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the reason that I'm drawing this is because I want to give you some background information on how labor and childbirth is initiated because positive feedback plays a role in this. So here's the uterus and right here at the base of the uterus there's a little opening that's uh, kind of a circular muscle, okay? So it's a circular muscle, but normally that muscle's squeezed tight and shut, and it's known as the cervix. And then below that is the vagina, okay? And somewhere typically in the last trimester um, of pregnancy, what the baby does is it flips upside down, okay? So it's upside down and it has this head that's heavy and big and it's sitting on the cervix. And because it's sitting on the cervix, it's putting a lot of pressure on it. And that pressure, because it's a muscular organ, it's starting to stretch it and it starts to open it up, okay? Just a little bit at a time. So if you look at this diagram here, okay, this kind of explains what happens and, and why the baby's head pushing on the cervix is necessary. I mentioned previously that as that baby's head's pushing on the cervix, it starts to kind of stretch it and open it just a little bit more and a little bit more. And what happens when that muscular cervix is stretched is it actually sends a signal to the brain. And that stretch in the cervix tells the brain to release a chemical, which is known as oxytocin. Oxytocin. So oxytocin gets released, it gets into the blood, it travels from the brain down to the uterus, and what oxytocin does, okay, when it contacts those uterine cells, is it causes the uterus to start contracting. So now we've got this baby, right, with all its weight behind it that's pushing on the cervix, and now this muscular sac that the baby's in is starting to contract, and that's going to push the baby's head against the cervix a little bit harder, okay? And when that baby's head pushes against the cervix a little bit harder, we're gonna get more stretch. And more stretch causes more release of oxytocin. And more oxytocin causes that uterus to contract down even more, which pushes the head against the cervix even more, which increases the cervical stretch even more. And we get this positive feedback system that's happening, that's amplifying the change, right? The change was the cervix started to stretch. Negative feedback when that happened would have caused it to go right back down to its normal size, right? But because this is positive feedback, what happens when the cervix stretches is we now initiate a change that causes it to stretch more and causes it to stretch more and causes it to stretch more until we've got a situation where the cervix is stretched to the point that the baby can actually pass through um, and pass through the vagina and be born. So just one example of a situation, a very specific situation in the body where positive feedback is regulating it, where positive feedback has to regulate it, right? Because if it were negative feedback, it would negate the change and that baby could never be born because the cervix would never stretch enough. So we do see examples, childbirth, um, blood clotting, also as examples of positive feedback that happen in the body. So that in a nutshell is homeostasis. That's negative feedback that helps to maintain that homeostasis and a little bit of a discussion on positive feedback as well.